Hey, it's Mark Podolsky at The Land Geek with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And I cannot tell you how excited, how pumped I am for today's guest. He's a big deal, but I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him, you love him. The brain, the professor, your flight school Sherpa, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd. How are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm a little intimidated, I'll be honest. It's not it's not every day we get this type of guest because look, you know you know who wrote on the back of his book? Sir Elton John, one of my favorite artists of all time. So let's just get into it. Our guest today is Steve Sims. Now, do you know anyone that's worked with Sir Elton John or Elon Musk? send people down to see the wreck of the titanic on the seabed or close museums in florence for a private dinner and then had andrea bocelli serenade them while they eat their pasta well you do now quoted as the real life wizard of oz by forbes and entrepreneur magazine steve sims is a best-selling author with blue fishing the art of making things happen sought after coach and a speaker at a variety of networks groups and associations as well as the pentagon and harvard not once scott todd but twice. Now, do you see why I'm intimidated? Steve Sims, welcome. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I would imagine within about three seconds, everyone's going to like, ah, he ain't that. So we don't worry about the hype. So, so Steve, let's just rewind the tape and tell us how did you become this guy that billionaires would seek to get things done? It was easy. Um, is not the answer you want to hear, but it, it always starts with, you know, a goal, a need, maybe a desperation. And growing up in East London, the son of a bricklayer, uh, my father was a bricklayer at the time, um, I was poor. And it sucks. And anyone out there that's poor knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I had this, 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 this urge, this lunge to go and find people that were rich to just be able to innocently point at them and go, hey, why are you rich and I'm not? You know, I need to know. As a bricklayer, I was getting up at 4.30 in the morning, working on a wet building site, cutting myself up, banging myself, and then going home at 8.30 at night, um, and then going to bed because I was exhausted. So I wasn't worried about the hard work, but the money wasn't coming. So I was obviously missing something. I went on a journey to change the room I was in. Um, and to explain that, I remember being in London one day, a very pivotal, a pivotal night. And I'm a biker. I ride motorcycles, have done all my life. And I'm in this bar with my buddies, all these old crappy little motorcycles outside that would start if they wanted to. And we're nursing our one or two beers because we couldn't afford any more than that. And I thought to myself, this entire room is full of broke ass bikers. And I'm one of them. So maybe if I change the room and the room's full of billionaires, maybe I'll be one of those. So that innocence, that was it. So I had to go and find a way of getting in that room. I applied for jobs as security guards, uh, limo drivers, doormen, uh, stockbrokers, insurance salesmen, financial analysts. I learned a ton of jobs that I was ill qualified to do until finally uh, at my lowest point, I was the doorman of a nightclub whose job description is to slap people. You know, that's what a doorman does, you know? Sure. And that, I thought, this is, I've gone from bricklaying, which is a noble trade, which is a skilled profession, and now I'm a doorman because I'm just big and ugly, you know? And I just thought, I've gone downward. But the funny thing was, this gave me a pedestal to watch how rich people acted to each other. You know, when you would, to give you an example, when the fancy car would pull up outside the club, is the car driving you or are you driving the car? And to explain, the guy gets out of the car or the girl gets out of the car and the ones that are kind of like love the car for them, they get out of the car. They don't care if you're noticing. They speak to the valet boy, maybe slip him an extra 20 to just look after it a bit and they go in. But the one that the car has driven them gets out and almost puts the jacket on in slow motion. So you've seen, hey, they turned up in a Ferrari, you know? 
And right. it's amazing how many people buy watches, cars, suits. They do all of these things for you, not for them, for you. And so I started noticing just these little differences within those people that were trying to be rich and those people that are rich. And let's be blunt. Look at Jeff Bezos. Look at Elon Musk. Look at Mark Zuckerberg. You know, look at Steve Jobs. Some of these people you would think were on welfare the way they walk around, you know, but they own, they could buy things like countries. So there is a difference. And I had to find a way to get into that group. And do you know the one thing that I found that was common with all people of high profile, high net worth, uh, high power, shall we say? They were actually embarrassed of using that position to get into things. So they no would say, to me, oh, you know, I, I want to go to that party. But, you know, I, I, they would go to, let me explain. A Hollywood, you know, movie star doesn't want to go to the latest nightclub as himself because he will be used as the marketing strategy for tomorrow. Hey, we were so cool. We had Brad Pitt here last night. Worse, Brad doesn't want to, and I'm using him as an example, doesn't want to be turned away because then it's a case of our club so exclusive, we even turn Brad Pitt away. So you suddenly become used. So they would come to me and I would arrange things. Now it started off small. You know, can you do this? Don't mention my name, but can you get me into this event? Absolutely. I went from throwing little private parties in Hong Kong, because that's where I was living at the time, to suddenly working for companies like Naris, the New York Fashion Week, Chicago Art Fair, Formula One, uh, and so on John's Oscar party. So I just went to see how far I could take it because I got into the minds of how billionaires and millionaires think, work, and act, and that's what I do now. All right, this is fascinating. I, I have so many questions, but I'll throw it to Scott, Todd. Go, go ahead, Mark. Let's see where you go. Well, I, you know, the first thing is, it's just, a, it's just such a, a wild sort of notion to think that billionaires have a problem that need to be solved. And, you know, if Scott and I are talking about, let's say, uh, you know, someone like Brad Pitt, my immediate assumption would be these guys have a sense of entitlement. They, they can just make a phone call or, or whatever it is. They wouldn't be embarrassed of, of using their celebrity or status to get access to anything. And yet I'm completely wrong. So, everyone's, yeah. everyone's got a problem. Everyone gets a headache after drinking too much whiskey. Everyone you know, gets overweight every now and then. Everyone has a problem. The, the, the biggest problem, and I, I'm, I'm going I'm to pick on you a little bit here, Mark, is the one that you have. Okay? Because straight away you turned around and gone, I could never work with those people. They have everything. They don't need me. You see, right. what, no matter what business you're in, and I will lead with this. My superpower is stupidity. I never overthought any of this. I just went out to find out. So I didn't have the, oh, my God, I can't talk to that billionaire. Oh, my God, I can't talk to that superstar. Quite the opposite. If I want to learn about finances, if I want to learn about real estate, if I want to learn about anything, surely the smartest person to go to is someone that knows about it and is credible. So sure. I, as a, as a child mentality, and my wife says I'm a 55-year-old, 5-year-old, I still go to people and go, look, I want to learn how to drive a car really fast. I'm going to go and speak to a Formula One driver. I want to know how to do, you know, artwork. I'm going to go and speak to Banksy. You know, I find the person of Pinnacle that can help me. The second you think it can't be done, you're right. But the daft thing is, and I can go back to the names that I gave you, even Brad Pitt, were any of the people that I mentioned, the Elon Musks, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Brad Pitt that we brought into this conversation, did any of those people come from money? No. So they know what it's like to be poor. They know what it's like to be hustling. But now they're in a position where people laugh at their jokes even though they're not funny. They, kind of, they put them on a pedestal. And straight away, they go, oh, they could never get that. Did you know the funny thing that these people miss? Being normal people. 
They miss the having a normal conversation. And so with me, because I never had any airs and graces, I would turn up on motorbike and I'd go, look, what's your problem? And they'd be like, hey, I need to go to this, but I don't want to show up as Brad Pitt. You know, I just want to go to the damn thing. You know, we would make it happen. The other bad thing is, and you're, you're correct, they can get into these things, okay? Oh, the, the, the famous people can. Bear in mind, two-thirds of my clients were the richest people in the planet that you've never heard of. You know, that own more shopping malls in, say, Russia than anybody else or own a particular length of pipeline for oil, you know, in the Middle East. And that just paid the licensing of that, you know, like billions of dollars a year. There's a lot of famous people, there's a lot of rich people that you don't know. So the famous ones, they're worried about using their uh, influence and their face to get something in case it comes back. And they go, oh, we let you come in here. I hear you've got a movie. Can, can my niece get on your movie? You know, they don't want those kind of tit for tat. With me, they pay me very well to get things done without utilizing or using up that notoriety. Fascinating. Scott, Todd, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think that, I think that uh, there's some key points in there. Everybody has a problem, right? Okay. Like everybody has a problem. And I always talk about Mark in flight school. I talk about the only reason that people even buy anything is because they have a problem, either real or perceived. That's like, that's my go-to line. And when you think about everything that you ever do in your life, it's always to either avoid pain or seek pleasure. And ju just like Steve said, you know, the, the billionaires, the celebrities, well, what are they doing? Well, they're either seeking pleasure by going to the event or they're avoiding pain by getting turned away. It's the pleasure and the pain thing all, all it's continuous and everybody has that problem. And I mean, to me, I'm, it's pretty interesting because one of the one of the things, and this would be me, right, Steve? Like this would be here in my mind, and not reality. It's a perceived. What I'm about to say is going to be a perception. But see, the thing is, is that I could not go up to an Elon Musk and say, "Hey, tell me about this," because I would be too intimidated. Now, Steve even said, "The minute that you think you can't." You're right, you can't. So the mere fact that I said I couldn't walk up to him and do it, it's it's here, it's mentally in my my own piece. And maybe maybe the key lesson here is stop. You're being stupid by saying you can't do it, just freaking go do it and be done with it. And then go talk to Elon Musk. I got a story for you that'll make you giggle. I had a client of mine that wanted to meet Richard Branson. And this guy is a billionaire. OK, so certainly financially, I'd even go as far as to say he's probably worth more than Richard. OK, and he's uh, from the Middle East and he comes over and he desperately wants to meet Sir Richard Branson. That's his thing that he wants. So I'd worked for his mum for quite a while. So I'd worked with Richard on a various few occasions. And I said to Richard this night, oh, I've got someone that I'm going to introduce you to at the end of the night. So I'm stood there with my client and my client's a big, stocky guy, bigger than me. OK, powerful yeah. Middle Eastern guy. And Richard's doing his walk out. He's leaving. I know he's leaving. He's notified me he's leaving. He's going to come over to me. But Richard does the two step. It's like step one, shake hands, take a selfie. Step two, shake hands. It takes forever for these people to actually leave a room because everyone jumps on them at that time. And he's getting closer to me and he's going to meet my client. Now, as he gets closer to me, my client is so in awe of meeting Sir Richard Branson, and you'll notice this a lot, he starts to bow. When you meet someone that's either really famous, really powerful, really, in your eyes, someone that's amazing, you go, oh, it's a pleasure. You do dip your head. You watch that the next time you see people. They do, especially when fans meet, you know, people on the red carpet and stuff like that, they dip their head. How can you speak to someone on a level playing field if the first thing you do is put them on a pedestal away from you? Okay? It makes no sense. So my client starts to bow. I only had a few milliseconds to correct his posture. So I leant back to scratch the back, uh, my back, smacked him on the back of the head. 
<laughs> now, my client's a big, rough guy. And in front of his idol, he hadn't seen us yet. I've just smacked him on the back of his head. Now, I haven't got a lot of hair, nor did he. So there was a resounding slap. He's, he stood up right, looked at me like he wanted to kill me. Just as Richard got in front of me, and I said, uh, so Richard, I'd like to introduce you. And I intru- Now, because my client was upright, he immediately turned around and went, pleasure to meet you. He was straight away upright, in his own, had his presence, didn't have fear because he wanted to munch me, and just kind of looked at Sir Richard and was like, how are you doing? And then they got into a conversation because they are locked as equals. Okay? And that was a bit... Now, afterwards, he went, you did that. And I said, you started bowing. There was I didn't have any time. And he was like, thank you, thank you. But so many people... You watch it. When you see shows or when you see like a premiere and the superstars walking down the red carpet and they walk over to see the fans, the fans bow. It's a, there is something in our psychology, in our human nature, that we bow to greatness. And that's the dumbest thing you can be doing. Interesting. Interesting. Well, let's say that, you know, Scott and I want to close down the, the, the biggest museum in Florence. And we want to have lunch in Florence. I can imagine that conversation. I call up the museum and say, oh, yeah, I, I want to close down the museum for, you know, a couple hours and have lunch. They would immediately dismiss me. How do you get these institutions to, to do things that right, so- normal people would not like they would laugh at us? Jesus, fella, I'm, I'm a kid that got kicked out of school at the age of 15. If there's no one more normal than me, then, uh, you know, how can there possibly be? So, so here's a couple of things you do for a start. And you made one mistake. Um, okay. But let's play a game. All right. This weekend, I'm having a barbecue. And you two are in Los Angeles. And I invite you to come to my barbecue. Okay. What's the first question you ask me? Where's the barbecue? Where's the right barbecue? What time? Right. What time? What time? What's another question? Can I bring a friend? Can you bring a friend? <laughs> great, great question. Another question? He's going to be there. Who's going to be there? Brilliant. Another question? What should we wear? Okay. Another question? Um, who are you going to introduce me to? Who am I going to introduce? Okay. You two are never getting invited to my barbecues, okay? Every I'm not asking you what, you, you, what you want me to bring. I'm not doing that. Why didn't you ask that question first? What, what can I bring? Because, you see, here's, because, the, here's the problem with every piece of communication today is that every question that you just asked, I graciously, with all of my credibility, you know you've got a book in your hand that's got the... The, the testimonial by Sir Elton John, you know I know people. Right. Yeah, every single one of your questions satisfied your, uh, your idea and your mind as to whether or not you should come to the party. Okay? Well, I this, didn't want to bow down to you. No. It, how was it bowing down by saying, hey, thanks a lot, Steve. What did I bring? Okay? Be- because I'm afraid you're going to put me to work. Hey, you can bring all the beer and serve it too. I'm like... Here's I'm the daft the thing. Guest, man. I fit in with these people. Here's the daft thing. When it, <laughs> and I, I hate to, uh, this, uh, hopefully this isn't being sexist, but every no, time no. you've got a lady on this kind of Zoom and I ask the question, the ladies are always the first one. Now, first question, before time, dress code, any of that is, that's great. what can I bring? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, here's the thing. If you show up at... Anything, anything, any celebrity, any event, any museum that you want to close down, and you show up for the selfish reason of your benefit, they're going to make you go bye-bye, okay? But if you enter into every single conversation, every single relationship with the concept, what can I bring to the party? What can I bring to this conversation? What can I bring to this relationship? 
It changes the dynamic of how you appear. Now, I wanted to take over this museum in Florence. I don't speak Italian. I have problems speaking English. You know, I didn't know anyone that was part of the, uh, the uh, museum. I knew new, nobody. It's in a different country that I have nothing to do with. But there's this wonderful thing that got invented a few weeks ago called a computer. And it's got this thing called the internet. And you can use it to Google things. I discovered that later on that year, that museum was going to have a gala raising money to repair its roof. You got me now. So I did a little bit of research because I don't think there's any such thing as a lucky relationship. They're always targeted. So I contacted them and I went, hey, how are you doing? I've got something that I want to discuss with you that's going to help my clients. But before we get into that, I noticed you've got a gala going on later on this year to protect the, uh, the roof repairs. How much are you looking to raise? They gave me the number. And I said, well, have you done any of the flyers or anything yet for that gala? No, we have not. How would you like, before you've even printed one flyer, to have actually gained 25% of the goal you need to be able to do the effective roof repairs? Would that be of interest to you? Absolutely great. Then let's get into what I wanted to talk to you about. I showed up with something of value to you. You know, whenever I've worked for an event, I've gone, hey, I love the event you put on. It's really good. I love what it stands for. But do you know with a few tweaks, you could brand it to a higher paying client? I started with Sir Elton John's Oscar party. When I first started, it was three and a half grand a ticket to be able to go to his party. And I said, stop doing that because it's easy credit card payment. Anyone can afford three and a half grand, but not everyone should be in that room. Okay? Because it's the wrong people you get when the level of entry is too low. Right. Went up to five and a half grand for back seats and went up to 18 grand through us communicating on better uh, pricing. Okay. They got less people turn up. They made about two thirds more money and they got a better stand of people and they got more repeats come to the event. So the bottom line of it is whenever you show up to any relationship, any project, anything you're going for, Stop looking at it selfishly as, well, I need this because this is what I want out of it. Show up with a solution. And as, as you were saying, Scott, when you show up as a solution and you're solving someone's problem, someone's pain, they no longer care what you look like, sound like, how you show up. If you can solve someone's problem, they don't care about all of the pretty branding, the sexy website, are you wearing a tailor-made suit? No. You can get a thug like me turning up on a motorcycle, <sighs> tattoos and piercings, but if I'm solving your problem, you're going to invite me in to play with the kids. Mark, and this goes exactly what we talk about in flight school. You see, when, when you solve someone's problem, they don't care if you have some magical brand, some logo, some polished company name. They don't care about that stuff. What they care about is that their problem is solved. And also, Steve, when you asked me to the barbecue, I thought it, I thought that you wanted me because I was like gonna solve someone else's problem. That's why I didn't ask you. I thought I was the thing that I was bringing. So sorry, <laughs> next time I'll ask what I can bring. There you go. I would have said a bottle of whiskey and good jokes, but there you go. You, why, there you go, you bottle of whiskey and tricks. Yeah, so Steve, I can definitely bring that for the next party. So I'm in. Well, uh, I, I'll have to consider whether or not I invite you guys, but you know, let yeah. me, I'll put you on the wait list. Yeah, so, so my I'm buddy Bruce. Our next party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. speaking of parties, my, my buddy Bruce, who introduced me to Steve, uh, goes to an event called a speakeasy. Um, Steve, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? And is, what is Bruce bringing? So, I'm curious. Uh, I want to go. So we, we had this, uh, it, it was a, I wanted to challenge my credibility. You know, that's the long and short of it. Three years ago, the book came out. I was starting to coach people. I was speaking on a lot more stages. But 
the old saying that everyone's in until they have to pay, you know? Right. So I thought to myself, I wonder what my credibility is. So I literally said, look, I'm going to throw an event. It's going to be, and the first one was in Carlsbad, which is in uh, uh, Southern California. I said, um, it's going to be on these two days, $2,000. Who wants to go? Now, I didn't tell you the location. I told you the city. Okay. I told you the days and I told you nothing else. Funny enough, I had a whole bunch of people suddenly starting to sign up. And I remember I phoned up one of my friends who, you know, knows me and the kind. So I knew that he was, and I phoned him up and I went, you've just paid $2,000 and you have no idea what's going on. Who's going to be there? What are you going to learn? You don't even know where it is. And jokingly, and I was being sarcastic. I said to him, what's your problem? Like, are you crazy? But I asked him that question. I said, what's your problem? And he turned around. He said, great question, Steve. This is what I'm having trouble with at the moment. And he started to tell me. And I thought, hang on a minute. How many events do we go to where we show up because this person's talking or this person's on stage or there's a cocktail party and they give you a schedule and they tell you it starts at nine o'clock and there's a tea break at 1030. And I thought to myself, I want to reverse mastermind this. So now what I do, and we've been doing this for three years now. We, our next one is in San Diego and it's sold out. So there's no pitching on it. Um, and what we do is we literally go, San Diego, these two dates, you'll know the location one week away, but this is the hotel that we're staying at. So you can buy your flights and your hotel and stuff. But then everybody that signs up, we contact them and we go, hey, Scott, thanks for registering. What's your problem? You know, what are you having trouble with at the moment? And then when we get that information, I can look in my Rolodex and I can actually bring people in that's actually going to answer and solve your problems and then spit you out of the event with more impact. So when people come to me, it's now a reverse mastermind, which funnily enough, I think should be the way all masterminds are done, where we actually want to know what are the problems. And we cap it off at a maximum of 40 people. They are creative disruptors, all willing to be challenged, all comfortable with being uncomfortable. We stick them in a room. We get to increase our support system because of the people that we're with. But more importantly, I bring people up. And the amount of people that forget the conversations they have with me and then come up and go, oh, my God, I can't believe he was here. And, of course, like, I don't have amateurs turn up. I have, when I, when I say, you know, rocket scientists, I've had rocket scientists. Um, but, you know, I bring people in and they go, oh, I can't believe do you know I've got that problem and he just answered it? And I'm thinking, well, yeah, because you told me you had it and I brought him in. But that's how we run uh, a speakeasy. And I didn't know what to call it at first. And so it was just this underground mastermind. And one of the attendees turned around and said, this is like a speakeasy. You know, you, you don't even know where it is and there's a password. And you don't know who's going to be there, but you know that's where all the cool people are going to be. And I went, yeah, that's right. So we ended up calling it a speakeasy ever since. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, Bruce and I were just talking about that. He said it's the exact opposite of what you would think in this room. He's like, it's the exact opposite of, 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 a, a, of a country club. No one was pretentious. Everyone was there was, was creative, high achieving, but wanted to help other people. So in some way, Steve, like what you were telling us that, you know, what are you going to bring to the party? Everyone was bringing something to that party. Besides, they weren't just there to take from the guests that they had no idea, these special guest speakers, they had no idea who was gonna be there. And, and Bruce said that his, his guest speaker was amazing. Um, but I do wanna talk a little bit about the book because I just opened it and I, I thought Scott Ty would get a big kick out of chapter nine, Ugly Works. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, and uh, I think this resonates from basically the interaction. It's been short, but the, the, the statements that Scott's been making. Um, we're in a world at the moment where far too many people are focusing on what they look like rather than what they solve. And when you solve something, as, as both myself and Scott agreed, all the rest of the stuff goes out the window. So while everyone's emailing and going, oh, I'm not getting a response, I would write on like a bar mat or sometimes I would actually do it on the back of a bar tab. And I would write on the back of my, my bar tab, I really want to have a conversation with you. 
And I had a couple of these whiskeys while thinking about how best to do it. So I thought I'd just prove I had those few whiskeys. When can we chat? Steve and like my email, put it into an envelope and send it to someone. So I would send like a handwritten letter. They would open it and inside is a bar tab. And then on the back of it, me telling them that I had two whiskeys while thinking about how best to contact them. And here's the proof I was having those whiskeys while thinking about it. And it was just something so silly that they would be like, and I'll get things like, that's the stupidest way of contacting someone I've ever heard. <laughs> but you know, they always contacted me. Or if I knew a client was going to, uh, and I travel a lot. So whenever I go to hotels and I've got a ton of it, you know, in, the, in this room here, I collect hotel stationery. And then what I do is I actually write letters to clients via hotel stationery. So they get a letter from the Wardorf in London. They go, who do I know at the Wardorf? Now, here's a little tip. The secretaries think it must be someone personal because it's from a high-end hotel and it's yeah, handwritten. They don't open it. So it gets through past the gatekeepers. Okay? So there's a little tip for you. And inside, it would be like a street map because all hotels have like the local street maps, don't they? You know, a guide to London, a guide to Florence, a guide to, you know, Pakistan. And you just slot it in there and go, hey, I wanted to contact you. But if you've ever thought of going to Pakistan, here's a little street guide for you. And it's just silly little things. And one of the things that <laughs> I've become, I actually became so kind of known for this that I got a, a shout out from Sky Mall. Do you remember that, that magazine? That yeah, you, of course. Yeah, they don't do it anymore. But what I used to do, because this was a time when planes didn't have internet, was I used to jump on the plane with me stack of envelopes from the hotel that I'd just left. And I would go through a Sky Mall. And quite often I'd have to ask, which I'm sure no one ever did, the hostesses for extra copies of Sky Mall because I would run through it and they sold the biggest line of crap you could ever find anywhere based on the assumption that you've been drinking the free whiskey so much at altitude that you think a Manatee post box would look perfect on your apartment. And so I would actually rip out these pages of the worst crap and then with a Sharpie go, hey, John, I know you bought a new house. I just thought this skull uh, garden a piece would look wonderful in your new man <laughs> and would just fold it, stick it in the envelope. And then when I got off the plane, I would just have them all posted out. But people would contact and even Sky Mall actually gave a shout out to me once about the creative use of a Sky Mall. Um, but I would do that all the time. And no one ever said thank you. They always contacted me going, that is the stupidest thing I've ever got. You know, why send me this rubbish? But they missed the point. Not one of them did not contact me. I always got through. They always contacted me. They always went, this was original. This was silly. I couldn't work out why you sent me this. When should we chat? You know, because people want creative disruptors in their life. And the downside is by ripping something out, sharpieing, handwriting it, perfection couldn't have been further away from this if you had tried. And I, one of my little go-to sayings is that perfection is a blue unicorn with three testicles. It doesn't exist. So <laughs> make it ugly, make it stand out, make it impactful. All right, Scott, are you glad I asked the question? Yeah, I have, I have two follow-up questions, Mark. No, Go ahead. Number one, Steve, does the Motel 6 have stationary? I've, I've stayed in a Motel 6 once in my life, and I never wanted to tell anyone that. <laughs> and, two, and two, what problem do you have that I can solve for you? Oh, well, for a start, you've got to know your target. Um, and I am, I live vicariously through my clients. And so I've got into rooms I never thought I would have got in. So any of my childhood, oh, I wish I could do this. Oh, I wish I could meet him. Oh, I wish I could do this. You know, they, they all kind of, you know, left the room 10, 15 years ago. So now, if you really know what problem I got, 
I'm trying to get my grass really green and I'm trying to get my bushes to grow really fast. So oh, I, I am an avid gardener and I just like being left alone. So that's what I'm up to. Oh, we can get your grass growing really green. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we're going to, you know, Scott will send you a new motorcycle. We know you like motorcycles. <laughs> that, you that'll, 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 get, that'll get him into the next speakeasy. So, Mark, so Steve, notice what he said, though. I just want to be left alone. I want to be left alone. <laughs> so, 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 Steve, I, I got to ask, who was the toughest person to get a hold of? How, how much persistence did it take? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. As soon as you use the word persistence. And I'm, I'm in pain now as I think about it. But it's this guy you may know called the Pope. Um, yeah, we, we've heard of him. Yeah, he gets around a bit. He's big in Italy. Um, yeah. If, yeah. If, if you want to kind of... Now, I've worked in the Pentagon. And I've worked in Harvard. And there was red tape, especially in the Pentagon. Okay, as you can imagine. Sure. You've never met bureaucracy like you've met when you're actually dealing with the Vatican. And I will tell you the story that I had to, and I can't tell you the whole thing that I did there, but I had to get permission stamps on this, this letter. And for a start, they would allow, only allow me to do it. So I would be here in LA and they would go, we can have it signed on Thursday. And I'd be like, that's great. Can I send someone over? No, it has to be you. So I would have to fly all the way to Rome, get it signed and then fly back to Los Angeles. And one time they actually said that I had to get it countersigned because uh, it had been approved. And I was like, okay, can I get someone to, and all I had to do was not get it signed. I had to get the letter picked up and taken to a different department. Okay. I didn't have to wait around or anything like that. Just get it transferred and they wouldn't do it internally. So I said, can I not get someone to pick it up that works for me and transfer it to the new department? No, has to be you. So I turned up, again, fly over to Rome, pick it up, came to this desk, picked it up, and I said to her, and you're not going to believe this bullshit, I said to her, where do I take it? She looked two desks away from her, and she went to Sister Mary. <laughs> two desks away. <laughs> And I'm inside, I am thinking to myself, well, I'm going to go to hell if I rip her head off. But are you telling me I've just flown 12 hours to go from here? So for shits and giggles, sorry, part of my friend, for a laugh, sure. I, I held my breath to see if I could hold my breath from, and in their words, to go from one department to another just to give her the letter. And I went, Shall I wait for this? And they said, no, we'll call you when it's done. And then I went back to LA. I had held my breath from one department to another because they could, that's the bureaucracy you're dealing with over there. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was one of those events that, yes, I made a nice piece of pocket change on that, but you could promise me a thousand times more than what I made, and I still wouldn't touch that deal. Wow. It was painful. It, it lost six months of my life, and I seemed to spend most days there in a constant state of aggravation. So, you know, it, I wouldn't take that deal again. Unbelievable. I, I have to ask, in, in your dealings with, with, you know, billionaires and, and accessing these very, very difficult venues and, and getting things done, What's some of the worst advice you see or hear given in this area of expertise of, of let's just call it, you know, exclusivity? Oh, easy. Uh, never lead with money. Never. You know, I was stood next to Elton John once and a guy came up to him and said, hey, I want you to, to sing at my barbecue. How much would it cost me to have you came in, uh, come in and sing at my barbecue? And he said, I'm sorry, I'm busy then. I walked off. Now, if you notice, he didn't know the date. It could have been right. in 10 years, time, five years time. But the second that you try to prostitute someone by coming up with a price tag, making them a can of beans, no one wants to touch it. So the common mistake I see is people walk in going, hey, how much would it cost me? You know, if I had walked up to the museum in Florence and gone, hey, how much would it cost me to, to take over the museum and throw a, a dinner party at the feet of Michelangelo's David at nine o'clock at night? How much? 
they would have hung up the phone. So I led, it was the same amount of money, but I led with solving a problem now. Okay, so too many people show up and go, how much would it never do that? You know, the second you do that, you've already lost. Scott Todd. Genius. 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 I, 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 this is a podcast I don't want to end, but at the same time, I'm now upset, Mark, that you have this magic book and you have a head start on me. <laughs> and I'm like, got to catch I, 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 Scott, I've had this for years. Listen, I didn't. I, did, I, I had no idea who Steve Sims was. On me. You, you've held back. You, I didn't hey, there's know a that. there's a couple of copies on Amazon, so don't feel as though you left out. You know, there's. I'm sure there'd be one or I'm two. I'm just upset that there. Mark's had a head start on me. That's what I'm upset yeah. about. Scott, if you want, I can I can I can read the blue fishing playbook to you right now. No, no. <laughs> throw I, I throw away the that can never be me mentality. Instead, ask why couldn't it. Yeah. No one ever drowned from falling in the water. They drowned from staying there. Don't be afraid to jump, Blue Fisher. Be afraid of standing still. See, great advice there. This is great. This is, yeah, the book is fantastic. So, Steve, what do you think is uh, normal or cool and other people think is absolutely insane? I think people often ask me, now, how did you get to meet him? How did you chat with them? And I find it normal because, again, I'm that five-year-old that go that I will go up to people and go, how did you do that? And what were you feeling then? For a start, I try to find a question that is not too boring, you know? So you don't want to go up to somebody and go, how did you do that? You know, you could twist it by going, that was amazing. How did you feel afterwards? You know, it's the same question, but you're now bringing in a different emotional context to it. Um, but I find that today we're moving out of the ability of two random strangers being able to contact. If you want to get arrested, okay, let me tell you how to do it really easily for which you feel is just ridiculous. And I've actually done this. I actually did it for one of my speakeasies as a little test. Go into a coffee shop, order your coffee, and then when everyone steps over to the counter, what's the first thing they do? Because God forbid they could stand alone quietly for a minute while they wait for that frappa lapper. They get the bloody phone out and they start going through the phone, don't they? They're sure. terrified, okay? Have you noticed that when people hold a phone in a public place, it's usually with two hands in front of them, which is the same as a boxing guard. It's a very defensive body position. And when you get into a defensive body position your mind becomes defensive. Now, if you are in that coffee shop, try and strike up a conversation with someone that's next to you, and they will look at you like you are a nutter, like you're an alien with three heads, because people don't do it anymore. So when you do walk up to someone, you go, hey, and try and think of something that's kind of completely abstract. I really love your shoes, you know? It, guy or female, just go, yeah, I really love your shoes. I was going, where'd you get those? Because I, I want to get a pair. Just people would be, the first thing you, if you say to someone, oh, I really like your shoes, do you know the first thing they do? What? They look down. Yeah, they look down as though they can't remember what bloody shoes they put on that morning. It's the most ridiculous, but it's a knee-jerk reaction. They go, oh, thank you very much. I'm thinking it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. You can't remember? But it's funny that people have a knee-jerk reaction, but people don't like having random conversations but when they have them and they are good they really enjoy them and they don't want them to end so i'm always very careful and i told you i never i never have uh you know potluck relationships i target every single person and a lot of my people are like how did you manage to have that conversation how were you in that room and i was in there not by luck but i planned what i was going to ask i planned what i was going to say and I find out something by Googling that they're into. Cooking, gardening. Like, you now know I like gardening. So if someone came up to me and said, oh, you know, you've worked with Elon Musk. Oh, what was that like? Or someone came up to me and said, oh, I hear you like gardening. What part of it? Which conversation am I going to want to lean to? The gardening. Bingo. Because someone's done a little bit of research. They paid attention to what I like. And that's the conversation I'm going to jump into. 
So I think a lot of people look at what I get up to as amazing. I think it's pretty simple stuff because it's basic art of communication and having this weird thing called a conversation. Scott Todd, you look like you got something on your mind. I mean, no, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, you know, like that's, that's the thing is um, like, for example, Mark, we, we do boot camp, right? And people come up and they start talking about land. And I like talking about land. That's not a problem. Um, but I will tell you that when someone, like people will come up to me and they'll say, hey, um, you know, I, you know, um, you know, I want to do a deal with you. Well, right there, I'm like put off, right? Like right there, I'm like, ah, I don't need anybody to do a deal with me. I got it. I got it. But then if they come up to me and they go, I mean, I just think about some of the best conversations I've had at boot camp. It had nothing to do with the land. It had to do with, hey, I, I fly too. Oh, cool. Let's talk about that. Um, or, you know, gardening, for example, in Steve's case. And I think that those those moments, you, you kind of get that better connection with somebody. And I think that, I think Steve's, I mean, I, I mean, it, it sounds stupid, simple. And that's how you started with this whole thing. It's stupid, simple. Yep. But really it's, it's not about you. It's about somebody else. I learned my lesson, Steve. When you invite me to that party, I'm going to ask you what I can bring or what problem I can solve for you. What What do you need, man? What do you need? I'll bring anything. I'll even bring Mark Podolsky if you wanted me to, or I'll fix yeah, it. Yeah, you, you want to get in the party, Scott. Don't bring yeah, me. Yeah. I, I want to get in Steve's party. So he sounds pretty cool. Yeah, I, I I do too. So, Steve, this is this has been phenomenal. I want to be respectful of your time, and we could go literally all day. And um, yeah, but we're at that point in the podcast where I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable. And we've gotten so many actionable tips that the our passive income listeners can go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? Um, challenge yourself. I think the trouble is we get into a rut. And so I constantly challenge myself and challenging yourself doesn't mean that you get into deals that are expensive. It could be like listening to a different radio station. It could be like trying an appetizer at a restaurant that you, you don't know what it is. It could be like turning left when you're supposed to turn right just to see what that area of the neighborhood looks like. When you try something different, it gets your mind engaged and builds up a habit and a trigger that oh we're trying new things which means you become open to new things so i constantly challenge myself my kids used to hate the fact that i would go to a the worst ones are sushi restaurants and go don't know what that is i'm having that and my kids used to hate it because we would end up with some of the most disgusting things that should never go in someone's mouth but now as my kids are older they actually turned around, they go, oh, let me pick the appetizer, and they pick the appetizer. And again, it'd be like, I don't know what this is, let's try that. So they become open. So I just, I just trying to get you, try something different with low liability, so low cost, but try something different and get your head engaged and building a habit that you are open to doing things different. I, I love that. And if you had more time, I can't tell you the first time I took Scott Todd for Indian food and how that went. Talk about challenging yourself. So, Scott, before we get to your tip of the week, I want to just remind the listeners of our sponsor, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. You want to challenge yourself, start building passive income, build that machine, but go up that mountain of land investing quickly, safely, and efficiently with someone like Scott Todd, who's done it thousands of times. It is a program where it's not academic. You will take action in real time. You do what he says to do. We guarantee that you will make that tuition back 180 days or less. Just schedule a call. Go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training and learn more. Thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? All right, Mark, I'm going to do a different tip instead of a book or a, I don't know, a product. I, I, just, want, I just want everybody to, to, to kind of take from this podcast what you want but also one of the things that i always i got from this podcast but i always it kind of aligns it and what steve said it kind of uh solidifies it and that is everybody does something because they have a problem everybody's looking they're calling you about your land because they have a problem 
So figure out how to solve their problem. And the minute that you solve their problem, you will not have any issues with money or sales. You just have to figure out what problem they're trying to solve, solve it. And then, you know what? We're all going to be at Steve's house for a party. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I love it. My tip of the week is learn more about Steve. Get blue fishing and um, go to Steve dsims.com uh steve d sims.com learn more learn the sims distillery uh the sims speakeasy he's got a podcast um and of course get the book it is just chock full of tons and tons of wisdom written in a really entertaining steve sims way steve i can't thank you enough are we good Thank you. We're good. I appreciate it. It's been fun. Cheers, guys. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. I want to thank the listeners and remind them the only way, the only way we're going to get quality guests like Steve Sims is if you do us three favors. you got to follow us. you got to rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review. Support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you the $97 wholetailing course, How to Double Your Money, 30 Days or Less, for free. Please do it. It really helps. I guarantee someone like Steve Sims is going to look at our reviews and if they're crap, he wouldn't even show up. So it really helps us. It helps you. And uh, thank you so much. Scott, you ready to do this? Let's do it, Mark. One, two, three. Let, Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Thanks there. Yeah. Now, now we're definitely not going to be invited to Steve's party. Oh, we, we will be invited. I will be with Steve. I'll tell you what. I'm, you know what I'm doing right now? I'm going to the nursery and I'm sending some soil. <laughs> Thanks, soil. everybody. He doesn't want dirt. Soil. <laughs> he want, yeah. And, and with a copy of Dirt Rich. All right. Oh, oh that's pretty, ah, nice. pretty good. Pretty All good. Right. See you guys. Thanks.